No, you let me have one affair? It won't last long. It'll be over soon. If you don't, the consequences will be yours, and you won't like them. If you file for divorce, I'll take everything you have from you, and you'll never see Tommy again. Your delusion? You can't possibly think I'd agree to that. You're out of your mind, Lydia sighed. I was afraid you'd react this way. I love you, but I need this, and it will pass. Don't do this to yourself. With icy calm, Isaac replied, are you the one doing this to me and threatening me? You should know that I don't respond well to threats. I'm leaving now, and I'll be back at 6 this evening. In the meantime, your lover can entertain you as he pleases. I'll never touch you again, but when I come back, you better go. Lydia opened her mouth but thought better of it, and lowering her head, walked out the bedroom door. Isaac Manor stood before the gate, finally released after enduring five years of imprisonment. Surveying the scene beyond, he spotted the waiting admissions committee, his ex-wife, and his former daughter-in-law. The guard paused, considering the situation. Despite being a prisoner, Isaac had always been cooperative and amiable. Order, although I'm unsure if it still applies, the guard pondered momentarily. Recognizing Isaac's demeanor, he called out to the gatekeeper, indicating that Isaac would be using the emergency exit. This way, he gestured to Isaac, leading him through a labyrinth of corridors until they reached a small steel door, which the guard promptly unlocked, allowing Isaac to step outside. Meanwhile, at half past two, Lydia, Isaac's ex-wife, glanced at her watch and turned to her father, inquiring, wasn't he supposed to be released at two? Her father nodded in confirmation. Concerned, Lydia approached the gate and questioned the lodge guard about Isaac Manor's expected arrival time. After checking the log, the guard responded he was released half an hour ago, upon his request, through the back door. Tears welled up in Lydia's eyes. Through the back door? But why? We came to welcome him home. I understand he's upset with us, but this upset? He has no one else. Do you have any idea where he might be? I'm sorry, ma'am. He specifically asked me not to disclose his whereabouts, and I overheard him mentioning a restraining order to the sergeant. Do you really want to pursue legal action against him after all he's been through? Lydia's face paled. A restraining order? Oh, I completely forgot about that. Meanwhile, Isaac walked briskly toward the bus station, reflecting on the past six years. He had plans of where to go and people he was supposed to meet. Six years ago, Isaac had been a happy man, married to Lydia for 18 years, and very much in love with his 16-year-old daughter, whom he named Tommy, short for Thomasina, after her grandmother. At the time, he was a 40-year-old software engineer, able to write his own computer programs and building self-learning robots as a hobby. He was also working on his so-called discipline project, rewiring and reprogramming the security system, adding an independent backup system. It included a hidden communication link to a remote and hidden server hard drive. The entire system had an independent power source powered by solar panels on the roof. On a whim, he built another secret system in his garden with a 4 baby backup outside the garden perimeter but still on his land. To complicate matters, he designed a dual camera system hidden in a sound system on the ceiling. Isaac needed a good security system as his one-man company did a lot of work for the government, and he was happy to work on this project. Anyway, his house, big enough for a family, stood at the end of a cul-de-sac in Dens, along with four other houses on the plot. Behind the house, he built a spacious office and still had enough room for a large garden. At the age of 20, he bought the plot and built a house bordering a forest reserve with the profits from the creation of an internet search engine for software solutions. He developed it and released it on the web, where one of the software giants immediately purchased it for use on their internet. Isaac was an average man, 6 feet 2 inches, 190 pounds, with dark blonde hair and light brown eyes, and a friendly face with generous lips and a beard that he had to shave off in the evenings when he wanted to go out and look presentable. He loved bicycling and walking but didn't like vigorous physical exertion. Isaac was shy, 
but when he came out of his shell, he became a caring, charming, witty person and a good conversationalist who could talk about a wide variety of topics. He was also an avid reader and could quickly read anything in no time and even years later recall articles and passages from books. This came in handy in his work. Six years ago, local sheriff Peter Rams asked him to update the program controlling traffic lights and dens. Traffic had to become more efficient to reduce pollution. That's when things went wrong for him. When Isaac and Lydia invited the sheriff to dinner to discuss the progress of the project, the sheriff, when introduced to Lydia, immediately began fantasizing about a statuesque woman. It took Ram Day six months to realize his fantasy. Late one morning, Isaac finished the road project and headed home to celebrate and take his wife out to dinner. In the driveway, he saw an unfamiliar car. Guests, he thought. He walked into the house and saw Lydia and Sheriff. What the hell is going on here, he shouted. The sheriff stopped, smirked at Isaac, then said mockingly to Lydia, Oh, the little one has learned. Now, I'll leave you two alone, and you tell him the rules. Lydia looked slightly embarrassed, but nodded in agreement as the sheriff walked out of the house. As the door closed behind him, Lydia asked Isaac, Can we talk about this like adults? Isaac's shock and sadness subsided, making way for an icy, calculating anger. I want you out of the house. Pack your things and leave. No, you let me have one affair. It won't last long. It'll be over soon. If you don't, the consequences will be yours, and you won't like them. If you file for divorce, I'll take everything you have from you, and you'll never see Tommy again. You're delusional. You can't possibly think I'd agree to that. You're out of your mind. Lydia sighed. I was afraid you'd react this way. I love you, but I need this, and it will pass. Don't do this to yourself. With icy calm, Isaac replied, Are you the one doing this to me and threatening me? You should know that I don't respond well to threats. I'm leaving now, and I'll be back at six this evening. In the meantime, your lover can entertain you as he pleases. I'll never touch you again, but when I come back, you'd better go. Lydia opened her mouth, but thought better of it, and lowering her head, walked out the bedroom door. Five minutes later, Isaac was back in the car and on the phone with his lawyer to make an appointment. In the evening, Isaac returned to an empty house, and his anger was replaced by sadness and grief. At eight the next morning, Isaac's attorney entered his home office. Ben Green and Isaac were good friends, so a meeting before the workday began was easily arranged. Isaac set down the coffee pot and asked, Coffee? Yes, black with a little water. The nail polish remover you serve as coffee is too harsh for my stomach. So, what is this problem you need to solve so urgently? Isaac told him about catching Sheriff Peter Rams with Lydia and also about Lydia's threats. Ben looked shocked and more than a little frightened. Peter Rams? Hell, that's bad news. He's corrupt as a rotting corpse, but no one can prove it. He got Lydia into this, and he always has other plans. You have to protect yourself financially and possibly physically. Isaac's brain kicked in with renewed vigor. His friend wasn't easily intimidated, so he came up with a quick end. Dirty solution. I'll give you power of attorney. You can print out the appropriate documents here, and I'll sign them right away. If things go wrong, you can handle my finances. Here is your corrected text with errors fixed and punctuation improved. I'll give you a flash drive with all the information you need, and you need to start the divorce, Ben nodded, and at half past nine, he was about to leave when there was a loud bang, and the door flew inwards. Five policemen rushed inside and knocked both men to the floor. Which one of you is Isaac Manor? shouted one of them. Isaac, lying face down, mumbled into the carpet that he was the man they wanted. You're under arrest, said the officer. For what? asked Isaac, stunned. As if you didn't know. Your wife and daughter have filed abuse charges, and they're being examined right now. I abused Lydia and Tommy? No way. I haven't touched them or seen my daughter at all since yesterday morning, Ben intervened. Isaac, keep your mouth shut. 
Don't say anything. I'll handle it, he turned to the officer and asked, Where are you taking him? To Second Street, came the curt reply. Be careful, Isaac. Don't let yourself be fooled, and don't say anything without my presence, Ben called out as Isaac was pushed into the back seat of the police car. Ben quickly made it to his office and locked the flash drive in the safe. He told his fiancée, Anna, who was also his secretary, that Isaac had gotten into a confrontation with Sheriff Rams and was suddenly arrested for assaulting Lydia and Tommy. He rushed to the station on 2nd Street. When he arrived, he identified himself as Isaac's attorney, and the officer on duty told him to wait. An hour later, the officer curtly informed him that Mr. Manor had been transferred to the Forest Lane station. An icy lump began to form in Ben's stomach. The thought flashed through his mind that Rams was trying to keep him away from Isaac so that he might have more time to force a confession. So, he rushed to Forest Lane. At the counter, he told the officer on duty that he had come for Mr. Manor, and the waiting game began again. When the duty officer said Isaac wasn't there, Ben had had enough. He pulled out his cell phone, scrolled through his contacts, and hit speed dial on the friendly judge's number. He explained to the judge what had happened, who was involved, and that they were scamming him. The judge told Ben to put him on speakerphone. In a clear voice, he asked, Mr. Green, is the officer on duty in the vicinity? Yes, sir. The officer is listening now, with his supervisor, Ben replied. Good, gentlemen. This is Judge Orlando speaking. It appears that the police are preventing Mr. Manor's attorney from talking to his client. Is that correct? Three broadcasts before noon is a bit much, replied the officer, flustered. No, sir. It's just a clerical error. Manor is on 2nd Street, the officer stammered, thinking, damn, damn, damn. Sheriff Rams can kiss my ass next time. I'm not going to take the wrath of that judge on myself. When Mr. Green arrives on 2nd Street, he will have access to Mr. Manor without any delay. Understand? Mr. Green will be able to speak to an unharmed Mr. Manor as soon as he enters the station. That means no bruises, no falling downstairs, no accidents, no questioning without a lawyer present. Do I make myself clear, gentlemen? Now, to the books. Your names, ranks, and badge numbers, please. Both men were sweating profusely despite the air conditioning. When the phone conversation was over, the supervisor offered to escort him to Second Street. There, he found Isaac sitting in a cell waiting for Ben. Ben pulled a voice recorder out of its case and pressed the red button. Isaac, have they tried to interrogate you? Yes, they tried. They also tried to intimidate me. They threatened me with a baton if I didn't confess to attacking and seriously injuring Lydia and Tommy. I told them to do what they needed to do, but that I wouldn't say anything without my lawyer present. Did they treat you well? They didn't treat me at all. I haven't had a drink since they brought me here, and I wasn't allowed to go to the bathroom. Then, all of a sudden, it stopped. I was able to go to the bathroom, and I got a cup of rotten tea. I'm afraid something bad is waiting for me. I'm sorry, Isaac. I'm afraid of that, too. It's all too well thought out. Have you been transferred to another station? No, I've been here since my arrest. Ben took a deep breath. I'm going to turn your case over to a colleague of mine. I'm basically a family law attorney. I'm going to handle your divorce. My colleague is much better suited for this case. Is that okay with you? Yes, that's fine. Just remember to use your power of attorney. Six months later in court, Isaac didn't stand a chance. Photographic evidence was presented, testimony from Lydia and Tommy, and two women Isaac had never heard of, who said Isaac was prone to violent tantrums. Isaac couldn't present an alibi for that night because the hard drive suddenly failed during the examination. He didn't want to reveal his backup system, independent of the one they'd sabotaged, he might need it in the future. The prosecutor portrayed him as a bad father and an even worse husband who mistreated and abused his wife and daughter. All the while, Lydia and Tommy sat staring awkwardly ahead. 
Isaac thought they didn't look very healthy, but he didn't care. He himself sat stoically on the bench, waiting for the axe. The jury swallowed it all and found Isaac guilty on all counts. Finally, the judge passed sentence. Isaac was sent to prison for five and a half years, minus the pretrial detention. With any luck, he'd be out in three and a half, but Isaac was counting on the full five because of the sheriff's tentacles. As the judge read the sentence, he heard Lydia sigh. When he looked at her, he saw that she had turned ashy, and his daughter was crying, eyes bulging. The only one grinning like the proverbial Cheshire cat was Peter Rams. Back in his cell, he got a visitor. The only thing the woman said as she handed him a thick envelope was, You have been served. Isaac handed the envelope to his lawyer and asked him to give it to Ben. Green left alone, Isaac sank to the hard bench in despair. Two weeks after the end of his sentence, Ben came to visit Isaac to talk about the divorce. In the envelope were divorce papers and adoption papers that needed to be signed in order for Tommy to be adopted by Peter Rams. Isaac signed them without a second thought, even though it hurt like hell. Then, he went over Lydia's demands with Ben, the house, half their savings, $5,000 a month for five years, and a trust fund for Tommy's education. Ben smirked but said nothing until he pulled out a small high-pitched buzzer for peeping protection. Finally, Isaac asked in bewilderment, that's it. So if I sign this, they'll leave me alone. And I can't go back to it. Ben, still smirking, replied, yes, that's right. Isaac was silent for a moment. The house was mine before we were married, so that's an absolute waiver. It remains mine. Please board it up and put a fence around it. Turn off the water, but keep the electricity on. And since Rams is going to adopt Tommy, he can pay her tuition. Can you do that? Five times twelve times fifty-five thousand dollars is three hundred thousand dollars, right? Just pay it in a lump sum. And half of our savings is about seven hundred thousand dollars. Offer her a round million and tell them to take the lump sum, no house, and no trust funds. Otherwise, we'll start a war and make it as ugly as possible. Ben gathered his things and told Isaac he would make a counteroffer. Before turning off the buzzer, he asked, didn't Lydia know about the investment fund? Isaac replied, I mentioned it from time to time, but I never told her how big it was. By the way, has the city paid for the traffic light software upgrade yet? I'm guessing not, so I'd remind them if I were you. This money, about $175,000, is your fee. Here's the corrected version of the text. I may need you again in the future. Ben went home both sad and happy at the same time. Sad that his friend would disappear for another five years in prison for something he didn't do, and happy because he could finally afford the house he and his fiancée had their eye on. But first, they had to get $175,000 out of the municipality. Ben knew they were legally obligated to pay it, but would probably do everything they could to avoid paying it. The next day, Isaac found himself in his new home. After the obligatory speech by the warden, he was escorted to his new residence. When he found himself in his cell, the biggest man he had ever seen stood before him. He was told that K2 was the biggest bully in the prison and that, as they promised, he would be given a warm welcome. K2 was concentrating on writing something on a piece of paper. Isaac took it all for granted and lightly cleared his throat. K2 growled at him, if you ever tell the others that I can't write properly, you will die a very painful death. Isaac was stunned and asked, no one took the time to teach you? K2 looked up in surprise. You're the first person to ask that. I've had to work since I was eight years old. What are you trying to write? No offense, a letter to my grandmother. She turns 87 next week. Can I help? If you dictate what you want to write, I'll write it down. No, I want to write it myself. I haven't finished it yet. When I'm done writing, you can rewrite it. That's a good idea. K2 exclaimed enthusiastically and clapped him on the shoulder. Oh, be careful, I'm not a mountain. Don't you want to learn to read and write? I can teach you if you want. 
The mountain man, whom everyone was afraid of, had tears coming to his eyes when he said, Yes, I would like that very much. But if you tell the others. Isaac quickly replied to defuse the situation, Why would I do that? You're trying, and that makes me try to help you. Anyone who tries deserves help. My name is Isaac. What's yours? I'm Fabian Small. Don't laugh at me, but everyone calls me K2. I don't know why, but they call me K2. K2 is the second highest mountain in the world. It's also by far the most dangerous mountain in the world, much more dangerous than Everest. I think you need to keep up Fabian's reputation, Isaac smiled at those words. After that, the ice was broken, and K2 dictated his letter to his grandmother. Isaac wrote it in large block letters, and K2 had no trouble copying it. Shortly thereafter, lessons began. After two weeks of detention, Isaac received a phone call. He had visitors, but he wasn't expecting anyone. Before going to prison, his brother had scolded Isaac during his only visit and told him he wanted nothing more to do with him. The only person he expected to visit was Ben, who wasn't due to visit him until the following week. Isaac walked into the visitor's room and saw his soon-to-be ex-wife and daughter at a table near the back wall. He walked over to the table where the guard was sitting and said with a chuckle, Come to gloat. Here's your chance. He turned and said to the guard, I've had enough. I want to go back to my cell, please, and walked out again. He heard Lydia wailing after him, Isaac, please wait, but he just walked on and the door closed behind him. Isaac turned to the guard and asked, Sir, is there any way to prevent this from happening again? They put a ban on me, and now they come to rub it in. The guard told Isaac that he would talk to the warden. Ben and Isaac sat in a small conference room designed for attorney-client negotiations. Ben, as usual, let out his noise emitter before saying, I have an amended divorce proposal here. Isaac raised an eyebrow. What do you mean, modified? More money? More what? Ben looked at his papers and replied, No, Lydia is willing to give up half the money if she can talk to you. I'm sorry, Ben, but you will be the bearer of bad news to her. Please tell her verbally that I would rather shell out about $500,000 than talk to her or her friends and relatives. Isaac, that's a very expensive disclaimer. You do realize that, don't you? Yes, Ben, I do realize that, but it's only money, and I've been humiliated enough. Please pass on the message, and may they rot in hell. Okay, I'll do as you ask. Is there anything else I can do for you? Isaac smiled in anticipation of what would follow next. He said, yes, you can. I need children's books for reading, starting from level one all the way up to the highest level. Two for each level. He was not disappointed. Ben's mouth dropped open, and his eyes got as big as saucers. Ben stammered, why do you need this? Did they blow your brains out? No, but keep it a secret. It's for my cellmate. I'm teaching him to read, and he's pretty good at it. So now I need books for him to read. Ben smiled. So typical of Isaac Manor. Good, I'll take care of it. The following week, the mail brought Isaac a package, much to the delight of the guards and prisoners. One of the guards unpacked the books and then commented on Isaac's intelligence. Isaac merely shrugged and accepted the comments without words. Back in the cell, K2 was furious about these comments, but Isaac only laughed and said, Don't worry, you and I know better. Let that be the case. Now, I want you to start on these two books. When you're done, I'll have questions, so read them carefully. What? You want me to read books? I don't need to read books. I want to be able to read so they can't get me into something. That's where you are seriously mistaken, my friend, and even more than you realize. First, reading books helps you to read newspapers and other things better by recognizing words more easily. Second, and I think this is more important, Reading books teaches you much more than just how to read better. Newspapers and books can be so much fun if you can read well. Just humor me, please. Start reading the damn books and make sure they don't notice you. 
Fabian hummed, okay, I'll try, but only because you called me a friend. Well, aren't you? Isaac held out his hand. K2's big paw squeezed it, and he replied, yes, you are my first and only friend. Isaac's only thought was that K2 must have lived a terribly lonely life and that he wished he could change that for the giant. Isaac entered his cell with difficulty. He had bruises all over his body. K2 immediately got to his feet, forgetting about the book, and helped Isaac into his bunk. Angrily and with a sound like rock scraping, he asked, What the hell happened? Isaac tried to catch his breath and wheezed, It seems my wife insists on taking my house, so her friend Sheriff Peter Ram sent me a message. You don't want to give up your house, you'll be beaten until you give it up. K2 growled, I don't care if they beat me to death, but the house is mine and will remain mine, if only for sentimental value. God damn it. Corrected and punctuated text. It hurts, K2 looked at the man. You mean that I can see it? Can you describe them? Isaac gave K2 a description of one of the four men before he went to the prison ward the next day. Four more men were admitted to the prison ward, all of them severely damaged to the other inmates and guards. The message was clear, and clear Isaac was to be left alone. Over the next month, K2 proved to be a sponge of information and a voracious reader. He was very intelligent, and only illiteracy had hindered his development. He was now catching up on his reading with fervor. He also began sending other inmates to Isaac, who became Doc Isaac. There were now about ten inmates in Isaac's class who needed instruction. During one of these classes, a conversation came up about life after prison and the difficulties of finding a job. Some of them nodded, having been in prison for the second time. When Isaac asked why, they explained that it was unlikely that anyone would hire an ex-convict or only for very low pay. When they wanted to start their own business, they needed an investor or a bank loan. Both were unlikely or at very high rates because of their past. That gave Isaac an idea. He asked them what kind of business they would like to start. One man with only four months to go admitted to Isaac that he was a baker and would like to open a bakery of some sort. So, Isaac asked him to write a plan outlining everything needed. The man looked at him strangely until Isaac told him it was an assignment for math class. K2 was also in that class, so Isaac asked him what he wanted to do after he finished his sentence. K2 told Isaac that he really wanted to work in the security business. Isaac smiled and said, it takes a thief to catch a thief. I have an idea, and if it works, I can be useful to you from now on. You're my head of security. Deal? With the familiar sound of stone grinding against stone, K2 replied, Oh yes, I agree very much so, and they shook hands again. During Ben's monthly visit, Isaac talked about his idea. He wanted to create an investment fund that would allow ex-convicts to start their own businesses. The fund would also help them deal with legal and financial red tape. Would Ben have wanted to participate? Isaac wanted to use some of his investment fund as seed money. After the divorce, Ben thought for a moment, then said, I agree. You handle the financial side, and I'll handle the legal side. Let's make a deal, and I'll get to work right away. What a brilliant idea. Then he became thoughtful again. Isaac immediately took him under his arm and said softly, What's eating you? Spit it out. Ben replied, I had a long talk with Lydia. She signed the divorce papers and is now only asking for half of the savings with no alimony. She was upset by your response, and I think she realizes that you don't have a chance to talk to her. She will not claim the house, and she will not ask for Thomasina's education fund. I brought the papers for you to sign. Isaac signed the divorce papers, surprised that Lydia had changed her mind. Six months later, he was a bachelor again. His first thought was freedom, but it turned out to be the opposite. Isaac began to get used to life in prison. His and Ben's investment fund was doing very well. They had already helped many prisoners get jobs or start their own businesses, and now the money they had invested was starting to bring in good profits. Isaac was highly respected, and any newcomer who tried to joke with him got a very painful lesson in proper manners. 
Isaac was even given a separate room for his lessons, as the guards and wardens were well aware of the calming effect Isaac had on these men. This made their work much easier. One day, a welfare worker approached him and asked, Why isn't your name still up for parole? Isaac decided to put it bluntly, because the warden is a friend of Sheriff Rams, and his reports on me are consistently negative. As a consequence, I don't even want to be paroled. Besides, if I get paroled, who's to say that my parole officer isn't also one of Ram's cronies? Could they, on a whim, put me back in prison and give me extra time? No, not for me. I'll be out in a year and truly free. You don't have much faith in the legal system of this city, the welfare worker remarked. No, ma'am. I was set up by the sheriff and my ex-wife when I caught them doing dirty deeds. But I can't prove it. Please don't talk to me about a fair legal system. Is that all, ma'am? Yes, yes, I'm sorry to bother you. Don't think about it, ma'am. The prisoners are quite happy with my presence. Good afternoon. The woman looked concerned as Isaac left. Isaac went to his training and self-defense class. He didn't like self-defense, but K2 insisted on it. During his almost four years in prison, Isaac had lost almost all of his body fat, which had been replaced by hard muscle, only because K2 required him to train. And after the last event, K2 started teaching him how to fight to incapacitate his opponent as quickly and thoroughly as possible. On his way from the gym to his cell, he was intercepted by a guard. The warden wants a word. His office, now. Damn, what did they come up with this time? Am I in trouble, he thought, feeling his stomach lurch. Outwardly calm and poised, he said, yes, sir. Do I need to clean up, or can I go like this? The warden said, now. You can clean up later. Five minutes after the knock on the door, Isaac found himself in the warden's office. The warden dismissed the guard and looked Isaac over. You might want to clean yourself up first. Isaac decided against the obvious answer and remained silent. After a while, the warden continued, I was told you know something about computers. Is that true? I was a computer programmer in a past life, warden, sir. That doesn't answer my question, prisoner. The question was, do you know anything about computers? There was something suspicious here. If the man was having computer problems, why didn't he just call the city council's information technology department? Isaac decided to take a chance. Sir, a computer has two parts, software and hardware. If it's a software problem, I can probably fix it. The hardware problem, the machine itself, is less likely. There's nothing wrong with the machine. Now, sit down and start looking for the problem. With those words, he left the office. Isaac, expecting a trap, started checking the computer. It was both a problem and a trap. The internet icon is in a prominent place, and they know that I have asked for the privilege several times. All of them have been denied, as have all the others. He has decided he will not go there. I guess they will keep an eye. On the connection. He started doing some research. The first thing he found was a keylogger. Oh, cheeky, cheeky, cheeky. Any other surprises? He smiled to himself and continued checking. After half an hour of work and with a deep sigh of satisfaction, he found many problematic directories and files, poorly hidden, probably by an amateur and no match for a seasoned professional, even if the latter was a bit cocky. But most importantly, he found the problem. Even for a talented amateur, it was pretty simple. But Isaac wasn't about to tell the warden about it. Isaac waited, standing next to the desk and folding his arms, until the warden and the guard entered the office again. They looked disappointed. The warden asked with annoyance, Did you find the problem? Yes, sir. I can explain it in private, please. The warden looked at the prisoner, who looked perfectly calm, and nodded to the guard to be left alone. Only after the guard closed the door did Isaac begin in a soft but firm voice, I found a huge amount of images and movies on this computer. I also found a program that records everything that happens on the keyboard. 
The downloaded video contained a software worm that is now slowly eating your files, including program files. You can try to claim that I am the one who downloaded these files, but the internet connection is monitored by the ISP as well. Thus, my lawyer will always be able to prove that I did not connect to the internet. I can solve your problem, but I need the internet to download some of my cleaning programs. The warden looked even paler than he was. It was a trap, and it had failed. He had wanted to trick Isaac into getting illegal internet access so he could then report it and add another year to his sentence. Now he had a bigger problem. Okay, from now on you have unlimited internet privileges. Now get to figuring it out. Oh no, sir, that won't happen until my lawyer writes that I am not responsible for the contents of your computer and that you are granting me unlimited internet access. How dare you, the warden shouted. Isaac fell silent and endured the warden's stare, finally saying, or you can call the city's information technology department to resolve this problem. The warden finally muttered, who's your lawyer? Late one night a week later, Isaac was on the spot. The warden didn't want anyone to know that an inmate was fiddling with his computer, so the first thing Isaac did was disable the keylogger. Then he compressed the files, but he didn't delete them from the computer. He hid them so that another programmer could find them in time and the amateur couldn't. When he was finished with that, he installed and activated the internet software of his choice and then began to look for solutions to the problems on the computer. When the issues were finally resolved, he began to brainstorm, curious about what his home now looked like and whether his alternative and hidden security system was still working. He paused for a moment to recall his IP address and password. To his joy, the system was still working, but what he saw simply amazed and horrified him. The house was nearly destroyed, and in the midst of the carnage stood Sheriff Rams, directing several men who were carrying something. He heard Rams shouting, Come on, we haven't got all night. It's got to be in the streets tomorrow. Suddenly, Isaac saw how he would retaliate, and a plan matured in his mind. First, he had some unfinished business. With a wide grin on his face, he began preparing his computer. He wrote a small program to make his security system available to view and download live images and loaded it into the system. Then he checked to make sure it was working properly. When it was ready, he removed all traces of his tampering. He replaced the keylogger with something similar but not as easily detectable. Finally, when everything was ready, he destroyed the malware he had highlighted earlier but left one small problem for it to come back in a year. Just as Isaac was finishing the job, a supervisor burst into the office. Are you finished? He asked impatiently. Just finished, sir. I think I've got everything, but a little out of it. If you have any problems, sir, please call. You bet I'll call, and I won't be so lenient. The guard will escort you back. Dismissed. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir, and Isaac walked out. Back in his cell, K2 only looked at Isaac and said, What are you up to? You look like the cat that swallowed the canary. Revenge, Fabian. Revenge. Now, who do we have lined up to talk to? Ben Green. I need him to deliver a letter. Do you happen to have a pen and paper? A week later, the utterly stunned FBI agent read with growing confusion the letter handed to her by the attorney sitting in front of her. In this letter, Isaac carefully explained what had happened to him and what was going on in and around his home. At the very bottom was a series of numbers and something that looked like a password. She asked the lawyer, Do you still have time? I need to consult with our IT people. Before Ben could answer, she dialed the number and barked out a few commands, causing Ben to mutter, suppressing a grin, I've got all day if you need it. The agent was beyond thrilled. If this was solid information, they would finally be able to nail that corrupt bastard Rams. The IT specialist came in with a cart filled with, among other things, computers and hard drives. When everything was ready, they checked to see if there was a connection. Ben confirmed that it was Isaac's house and was shocked by its condition. After that, they let him go. The letter stated that most of the action started late at night shortly before Isaac's release. The house was in turmoil. 
He was waiting for a visitor when Peter Rams entered to speak to a lawyer. Loud and rude, he was shackled and accompanied by two guards. Suddenly, he noticed Isaac openly smirking at him. Isaac could not help himself and laughed loudly. Rams became furious and shouted, What are you laughing at? I still have friends outside. They'll take care of that piece of ass and that little. When they're done, we can always sell them to a brothel, K2, who had been planning his future with Ben, flinched and saw Isaac turn ashy. K2 looked at Rams with a fierce hatred in his eyes. Isaac was distracted by his visitor. She led him into a small conference room and pulled out a device from her bag, similar to the one Ben always used. Finally, she said, Thank you. Your signal helped us catch them in the act, along with the records we pulled from your security system. He's going to go to jail for a long time. But that's not why I'm here. Because of the sheriff's off-duty activities, he owes the IRS a lot of money. Normally, when someone reports tax fraud to the IRS, there's a reward. We thought we'd give you this reward as a thank you. Of course, we don't know how much it will be yet. Knowing this favor, Isaac marveled at the effort they had put into this and replied, I am grateful. Thank you. I'm happy enough to see the bastard behind bars. As it is, they talk some more. The agent was trying to figure out how Isaac had found the entrance to his security system. Isaac smiled and dodged all questions. He still had a score to settle with the warden for stripping him of all the privileges he was entitled to and for the negative reports the warden had issued to keep him in prison. That night, Peter Rams woke up in his high-security cell, very dizzy and lying on his back, which made him very uncomfortable. Stretching his arms and legs out in different directions, he tried to roll over to a more comfortable position, but it didn't work as he expected. He was tied down. Did you threaten Doc Isaac? You're going to pay if you entertained his wife. It'll cost you more, the voice came again. If you try to threaten Doc again, you'll find out that we can get to you anytime, anywhere. Now listen very, very carefully. If Doc Isaac just stumbles and you or any of your little friends are in the neighborhood, or if anything happens to Doc's family or friends, however distant, we'll come and get the other one. Do you understand? We also think it would be good of you to apologize to all of us for the inconvenience you have caused this man, but that, I suppose, is not in the stars. The startled former sheriff nodded vigorously in agreement. Shortly after the incident, a guard led Isaac through the prison maze and then watched him leave through the back door. Isaac entered the bus and bought a ticket for a simple purpose. He needed transportation, communication, and a place to sleep for that night. That's where the XCOM services network came in handy for him. XCOM had been opened at the same time as Isaac and Ben's investment company called Iscon Investments. After three quarters of an hour, Isaac got off the bus and walked for another half hour until he reached the parking garage. There he was greeted with a hearty shout, Doc, you're out. Welcome back. Want a drink? Isaac smiled broadly, no, thanks. I need transportation. What do you have for me? The man smiled back and replied cheerfully, Ben already told us you were coming. I picked out a Nissan truck. It's a nice, clean truck cab with low mileage, powerful four-wheel drive. It's right here. Isaac looked at the truck, smiled, and said, It's a great fit. I'll take it. How much? The man looked shocked. I can't make you pay after all you've done for me. Nope, can't do that. I'll settle for a discount, but no freebies. And don't argue, Isaac insisted. The man sighed. Ben predicted that we'll figure something out. Enjoying a cup of tea, Isaac waited for the paperwork to be sorted out. A little while later, he started the truck, familiarized himself with the layout and operation, before heading out to visit his trusted friend. Late in the afternoon, he settled into a comfortable chair with a deep sigh. It's been a long time since I've sat in a chair like this, he said to Anna, now Ben's wife. Anna smiled at Isaac. She was very fond of the man. Many times she had gone with her husband to the prison to see him, and like her husband, she knew Isaac was innocent. At the same time, she noticed that his face was badly haggard. 
many disturbing wrinkles had appeared on it. His eyes were soft and bright before, but now there was sadness in them. Because of his beard, his face was no longer as easy to read as it used to be when she could read him like a book. His manners, however, were still those of a gentleman, courteous, well-placed, and indeed gentle. Isaac brought her flowers. He still remembered Ben and Anna's wedding day, even though he had not been able to attend. She told Isaac that Ben could come at any time, and he would pick up the Indonesian food on the way home. They knew it was Isaac's favorite food. Ben entered the hall with great enthusiasm. What's that ugly sapphire blue truck doing in my driveway? He laughed, and the men embraced. Welcome back, Isaac. I'm so glad you're here. Isaac just nodded, suddenly at a loss for words. Anna stroked his back and quietly told him, It's okay, we understand. Take your time. Isaac flinched. He shook his head to dispel the gloom and said, Sweet home. The spell was broken. Isaac, what do you want to drink? Beer? Isaac thought for a moment and replied, No, just some sparkling water. I haven't had a drop of alcohol in 52 years. I'll keep it up. Anna started to serve dinner but suddenly stopped with a tray of delicious smelling food in front of the two hungry men. She smiled and said, Now that you have my attention, I have something to say. We will dedicate this evening to celebration. Tomorrow, you can go off to fight dragons again. Deal? Both men immediately agreed. It was the signal for a very enjoyable evening. For the first time in almost seven years, Isaac felt calm and relaxed. At the end of the evening, Ben told Isaac that they had already prepared the guest room for him. Isaac felt a little awkward and said, This is too much. I can go to a hotel. Anna said in a tone that did not tolerate objections, I insist. You'll spend the night here. Tomorrow, you'll probably want to go look at your house. I don't think you should go alone, so we'll go with you. That's out of the question, too, Isaac gave in. I am in your debt. Now I am dead tired. Please show me where I can spend the night. Anna said again in the same tone, are you out of your mind? We're your friends, you know. Get that into your thick skull. You damn sure paid for most of this house out of the money from the traffic light project. Ben will show you the way. Tomorrow will be a new day. Much more gently, Anna said to Isaac, Sleep well, you big guy. Don't forget that we love you too. Isaac didn't sleep well that night. The bed was too soft, it was too quiet. He missed K2's snoring and the noise from the prison, but eventually, he fell into a restless sleep. Laura watched people pull up to the house at the end of the street. They drove up in two cars, stopped at the gate, and got out, one woman, two men. Since the FBI had used her house as an observation point before the raid, she was wary of strangers showing up. She pulled out the binoculars the FBI agents had forgotten to bring with them and looked around carefully. A man and a beautiful woman were clearly very much in love with each other. They waited until the thin-bearded man got out of his blue truck and looked around carefully. She pointed the binoculars at his face, which had crow's feet visible around his eyes. When he turned to look around, she got a good look at his eyes. She inhaled sharply. There. They were light brown and reflected intense pain. She also noticed that the pair were looking at the man in his ill-fitting clothes with great compassion. Finally, all three of them walked through the gate into the front door, whereupon the lone man returned to his truck and picked up a crowbar. Shortly afterward, they entered the house. Laura put down her binoculars and prepared to pick up her son from school. Isaac walked through the ruins of what, six years ago, had been the interior of his house. Now, everything around it seemed ruined because of what had happened here and to Isaac. Here's your corrected text with errors and punctuation fixed. It was just another building. The furniture was stained, chipped, and damaged beyond recognition. The kitchen was so dirty and broken that it would have to be replaced. There was a foul odor in the bedrooms. In fact, the whole house smelled like a public restroom, and in some places, it smelled even worse than a prison. Electrical wires had been cut or ripped out, and the ceiling had been torn down so that the main security system could be shut down. 
All the electronics, computers, and other valuables were gone, probably stolen. Isaac wondered if he could ever make this place a home again. He left the house again and headed to his truck, where he opened the back to get his stuff out. Yesterday, he had bought three folding chairs, a camp bed, a sleeping bag, and other camping supplies like a stove and such. He also bought toiletries, clothes, and towels. After picking up everything he could carry, Isaac began to get it into the house. When Laura returned with Timothy, her ten-year-old son, she was just in time to see Anna, who was asking the sad man something. To the amazement of both women, it was at this point that Isaac finally lost his temper. After assessing the damage to his home, Isaac began to slowly lose his resolve. All that was left of his life before prison was a bare husk, badly tainted by misuse and bad memories. He laid out his bed and kitchen utensils in the cleanest room he could find and was about to rest in the sun when Anna asked softly, Isaac, is this a good idea? Isaac, with sobs shaking his body and tears streaming down his beard, collapsed into the chair next to the front door that he had just reclined. The frustration, pain, and grief shook him to the core. Ben jumped out of the house and immediately enclosed Isaac in a hug. It's okay, Isaac. It's okay, we're here to catch you. Just let it all out. I've got your back. Let it all out, we understand, Ben said softly to the distraught man, whispering softly to Anna himself, finally, he's finally showing some emotion. It took Isaac quite a while to come to his senses. He finally hugged his two friends and said, Thank you. I wouldn't have known what to do without you. I'm calm again. The way they treated the house was just unbearable, Anna said, still very worried. We should get going. Are you sure you want to stay here? Please come with us. Isaac smiled slightly. I'm fine now. I need to get a new phone and start taking care of business. This is my house, and I'm going to make it my home again. Don't worry, I'll be fine now. For something more practical, your phone numbers, please. I only have Ben's office number, Anna replied. The two handed Isaac their business cards and silently headed to their car, while Isaac went back inside. As they were about to get into the car, Laura approached them. Good morning, I'm a neighbor. I apologize for the intrusion. Can I ask you something? Anna looked at the woman. She had a beautiful face, despite the worry lines framed by a halo of curly light brown hair. She was slightly overweight, but still shapely and moved gracefully. Anna answered a little curtly because of all the emotions she had been going through in the last few hours. You can ask questions, but I don't know if I can answer them or if I even want to. By the way, my name is Anna, and this is Ben. I'm Laura Wyatt, and I live there with my ten-year-old son, Timothy. I was wondering if your friend is okay. It's been a pretty bad neighborhood lately, so I'm worried about my boy's safety and mine. Ben laughed out loud, but it was Anna who replied, Laura, your neighborhood has gotten just a heck of a lot better. No, there's nothing wrong with Isaac. He'll get better with time. Laura was not yet relieved. So, he's not dangerous then? I'm sorry to ask, but it was so bad. Isaac dangerous? No, Laura, no matter what the rumors say, he's not dangerous at all. He's one of the gentlest people I know, and he'll probably be the best neighbor you'll ever have, Anna assured her. With those words, Anna got into her car and drove off, leaving the confused woman behind. Isaac was walking through his house. He noticed that the wires in the fuse box had not been cut, only the fuses were gone. The small black box hidden in the niche above the door seemed to be untouched. It was the fuse box for the solar panels that powered the backup security system in the house. The other panels powered the system outside, which in turn had been the cause of Peter Ram's death. He walked straight into the study that had once been his office but was now littered with trash, empty cardboard boxes, and the like. His desk still stood in its place against the wall, covered in dirt. Feverishly pushing everything aside, he flipped the desk over with great effort and propped up the base. It came free, and with it, the hatch. Behind the hatch was the backup security system, blinking green. Isaac thought, she's still here. 
This has turned out to be a very worthwhile hobby, assuming, of course, it's still working. He was pretty sure they hadn't found a single camera or microphone, otherwise, they would have torn the house apart to find the system. Add a computer or laptop to that list, he thought. Isaac never bought to take notes, his memory hadn't failed him yet. The afternoon was spent shopping. Phone and ISP tablet and laptop computers would come later because they can't be charged. Flash drives and a small generator for electricity, solar panels were not enough to supply his needs. He returned to the house with a truck full of stuff and dinner. After finishing dinner, he pulled out his cell phone and called Ben. Hey, Ben, it's Isaac. Do you have a pen and paper? Isaac gave Ben his cell number and new email address and asked for a list of XCOM companies. A few minutes later, he received a reply. Ben could always anticipate Isaac's train of thought and had prepared everything in advance. The next morning, Laura looked out the window and saw her new neighbor sitting in the morning sunshine in a folding chair at a folding table with a laptop and talking on the phone. Laura made inquiries online and was again confused. The man had been in prison for five and a half years for assaulting and physically harming his wife and daughter. To deserve that kind of punishment, you had to be very cruel to another human being. But this man and woman told me. He was harmless, Laura thought, and decided to be cautious today. She only had Timothy to take care of since, unfortunately for her, she was working part-time. She wished she had more hours, but it was out of her hands. Her employer was very inflexible. She was having breakfast with Timothy when a van pulled up to the house. It said on the site, Excon Services. Underneath, it was written the following, We've had a hard time learning to be honest, but now we do honest work at an honest price. Call and a phone number. She saved it to check it online when Tim was in school. Two men got out of the car and greeted Isaac with smiles and handshakes. They had a thermos flask and a large bag. Isaac laughed, and they all made their way into the house. Isaac noticed that the neighbor had been watching him the day before. Now he saw her look again and thought, word will get around soon. Maybe we'd better hold off on the introductions for now. He began handing out instructions to the men. I need to clean everything up. We'll start with the kitchen, the bedroom, and my office over there. Everything can be scrapped. If you find anything and don't know what to do with it, just come and ask. That same afternoon, a truck pulled up and unloaded a 40-yard dumpster. A short time later, Laura looked outside again and saw a minivan with the XCOM services sign on the side. A woman got out of it, looked around, and gave directions to the others. When she finished, she walked to the back of the van and pulled out a large bouquet of flowers. Then she walked to Laura's front door and rang the bell. Laura opened the door, and the woman handed her the flowers with the words, Regards from Dr. Isaac for the inconvenience, and if we're being too loud, just say the word and we'll stop. The woman walked away, leaving Laura with her mouth hanging open. Laura looked over to the other house and saw Isaac sitting at a table next to the front door. He looked up at her and waved. She held out the flowers, waved back, and went inside to find something to put them in. She felt strangely elated. Two weeks later, two dumpsters later, the house was cleared of the past, and Isaac and the contractor had finished drawing up plans to restore the interior. Admittedly, it was far from complete, only his bedroom and part of the kitchen remained usable. Isaac was sitting at his usual desk near the door when the downpour began. A shelter had been built next to the house, and when it started to rain, he retreated under it. He liked being out in the fresh air and breathing in the smell of the forest. He was enjoying the sound of the rain on the tarp when he heard the car engine stall. Looking up, he saw that Laura was in a panic. He grabbed his umbrella and walked over to her. Good afternoon. We haven't been introduced to each other yet. I'm Isaac Manor, your neighbor, as you may have noticed, Isaac said, smiling slightly so as not to give away his remark. Yes, I'm sorry. I'm in a hurry. I have to pick up Tim, my son, from school. I'm late as it is, and my car. Whispered Laura. From the sound of it, your car isn't going anywhere. 
you can take mine if you want. Or, if you're not afraid of being seen with an ex-gun, I can give you a ride, Isaac offered. Laura was a little taken aback by Isaac's offer. She thought feverishly, weighing the pros and cons, and finally said, I'm more afraid to drive that big truck of yours. Would you mind driving it? Sure, grab your coat and hop in. I need to lock up. Maybe you could use some help with the car, Isaac whispered. Shamefacedly, I can't afford it, my ex. Isaac interrupted her before they drove to the school. Neighbor, I said help. You mean help, you know, help with no strings attached and no payment of any kind. Just a friendly face and a cup of coffee sometimes. That will be enough. Laura noticed that he addressed her as neighbor, and she felt embarrassed. She said, I'm Laura Wad. I apologize for being so rude. Yes, please, if you can run it again. The last word sounded partly hopeful, but also partly apprehensive. Isaac pressed the speed dial button on his phone and put it on speaker mode so Laura could listen in. Two, Doc, came over the speakers. How are you doing, and how can I help you? I'm doing fine. Keith, could you call Joey and have him check out my neighbor's car? The keys are in the ignition. The car just stalled. We're picking up her little boy. Sure thing. Document. Anything else? Have Joey call me when he has news, please. I will. And did you know that K2 is scheduled to appear before the parole board next week? Mr. Green has already been informed. Isaac laughed. Thank you. That's good to hear. Another startup. This already feels like a job. I'm going to need an assistant soon, I think. Laura looked at Isaac in confusion. When I try to make an appointment with the garage, I have to wait at least a week. When and how am I going to get my car to this garage so soon? Don't worry about that. Joey's already on his way with the truck. I think you're their boss. Are they that quick to respond? No, I helped them set up the business. That's all there is to it. Don't try to tell me you haven't looked me and Excon up on the internet or that you haven't heard the rumors going around about me. But the truth is that Ben Green, you know him, and I founded Iscon Investments and Excon Services to help formerly incarcerated people start their lives over. It's working out very well. That's why I get a little extra service. Laura looked at the man, seeing him in a new light. If only he hadn't mistreated his ex-wife and daughter. Pulling up to the school, Laura got out of the car and waved as she saw Timothy waiting for her. Timothy's face lit up when he saw the car, and he exclaimed, That's our neighbor's truck. Cool. Why is it here? Laura helped Tim into the cab and buckled him in. She said sadly, Our car broke down again. Isaac turned and said, Hi, big boy. I'm Isaac. If your mom doesn't mind, you can call me that too if you want. Now let's get you home. Back in the house, Joey took Isaac aside. Doc, this car is a death trap on wheels. The motor is wrecked, but everything else is worse. What do you want? Isaac thought about what Laura had told him and asked. She can't do it without a car. Do you have anything in stock? I have a nice little Nissan Rogue, only it's not a pretty color. She can have it. Should I ask her? No, just. Take this one and change it. Send me the bill. I can't have dead neighbors or neighbors with dead kids on my conscience. Joey walked over to Laura and said, Excuse me, ma'am. I need to get your car and ID, please. Laura was close to crying. I need this car. I can't pay for the repairs. Don't worry, ma'am. Doc's already taking care of it. I'll bring a replacement tonight, Laura stammered. Isaac took care of it. He can pay for it. Is he always like this? And call me Laura, please. You have no idea, Madam Laura. He's one of the nicest people I know, honest, intelligent, and generous. And I know where that little preservation goes. No, Laura, he never asks for anything in return. You better not start a conversation with him because he considers it an insult. That's why everybody goes out of their way to help him with the work that needs to be done. 
H.E.K. is still paying, whether you want him to or not. And there are a lot of people who owe him, he paused for a second before adding, and I, for one, don't believe for a second that he did this to his ex. I've seen him work out in prison, he just doesn't have it in him. I've got to go, sorry, Laura. I'll see you after dinner. Meanwhile, Isaac finally found the courage to open the backup hard drives, plugging them into the laptop. He began to check how long they had been functioning. The first recording started as soon as he had installed an act that activated the entire rig. He watched in silence as his wife backed away from her wedding vows. A few weeks of recordings later, he saw his discovery and subsequent conversation culminate in a threat as he left, and Ramsday arrived an hour later. What followed next nearly opened the gates of hell again. Ramsday calmly explained how to get Isaac to comply. They would be made up at the makeup artists as if they had been mistreated. Lydia would report to the police that they had been attacked and hurt, and Rams would take care of the rest. He will get Isaac to comply, after which Lydia will take the statement. What followed was a recording of the makeup artist going about his business and someone named Doc signing some papers. Isaac sat in silence, tears streaming down his face. He felt terribly betrayed. Suddenly, he had had enough and quickly scrolled forward through the notes. He stopped when he again saw Ram sitting in the house in the condition in which he had found him. Something caught his attention, something in the body language of the men, including the prosecutor and the judge present, made him play the part. He heard Ramsday say, no, this man has become a nuisance. He must be stripped of his ability to speak forever, just throw him in the lake with a concrete block around his ankles. That's when Isaac stopped his surveillance. He shut down the hard drives and called the woman at the FBI. It took a while, but when he finally got through and explained what he had witnessed, they arrived very quickly. Isaac had already packed up the two discs and told the woman, I need a certified copy of the records of these dates. He handed her a note with the dates on it and continued, These records show that I was framed and imprisoned.